two, three. And we're back. QAV 623, June the 6th, 2.17 p.m. on the West Coast. No, East Coast. Which coast are we on again? How are East you, coast. T? How are you, TK? I knew that. <laughs> <laughs> really well. Good, thank you. That's good. How was Wagga? Fantastic. Yeah. That's good. You played some golf? Got some golf played, in? Played a couple of games of golf. Yeah. Well, actually, the weather was really good. It was um, a bit like Sydney. It was sort of 20 degrees. Uh, days are pretty short, but uh, nights are cold. But the day was lovely, lovely and sunny. And you got to watch a spider. Yeah, as I was telling you, I saw a spider eat an insect, which was absolutely chilling. <laughs> absolutely chilling to watch this insect walk, mm. just just mosey on over near the web, get caught, spider comes down, completely cocoons it in about 30 seconds, pulls it up, starts to eat. It was just, oh. <laughs> Nature is chilling sometimes. That reminds me of Tom giving Shiv the uh, scorpion gift. Yeah. <laughs> in succession. <laughs> Uh, all right. I want to do a shout out to Warren, one of our uh, relatively new club members. Had a good Zoom session with Warren last night and walked him through building a checklist and that kind of stuff. Over in WA, say hi, Warren. Um, RBA today, Tony. Uh, the market was up yesterday briefly, and then yeah. everyone said, "Oh, the RBA are probably going to announce another rate rise." Has it happened yet? What's like? No, two o'clock, isn't it normally? Oh, two thirty. So yeah, we're about to find out. We should have recorded, waited ten minutes, and yeah, I bit well, we'll know during the recording. I'd be surprised if they don't. Yeah, yeah, and, so, and you know the whole. Uh, I, I bang this drum all the time about interest rates being a blood instrument, but really, uh, is uh, someone should go back and perhaps they do in the RBA, go back and just see how effective raising interest rates is. Like we're in this cycle now of wage growth, and that's one of the reasons why I think interest rates will go up. Wages are going up because of inflation, which is also being pushed up because of interest rates, because you know rents rents are going up and um, <clears throat> the cost of you know cost of doing almost everything is going up um, because of interest rates, uh, which is forcing wages up. So the problem isn't wages by itself or interest rates by itself. The, Inflation is being caused by energy, so the Ukraine war, amongst other things, and uh, supply chain issues as a hangover from COVID. At least the supply chain one starts to resolve itself, but why put up interest rates? It just makes it worse. So I'd like to know if there's any analysis which show that raising interest rates is actually helping in this circumstance because, uh, you know, it's almost a fiscal problem that the government's trying to... Um, alleviate, at least on the energy side, by providing some subsidies and capping prices. Uh, they can't do much about supply chain, I guess, but that should resolve itself. So it's almost like a vicious cycle. Interest rates go up, wages go up. Wages go up, interest rates go up. It's uh, it's a very blunt instrument. So um, I, I, I hope someone at the RBA is looking at that. It's the James Bond of economics. <laughs> <laughs> Why is that much money, Penny? Older James, uh, more recent James Bond. In the in the <laughs> first, in the first of the Daniel Craig films, M says to him, I think it's the first one, I realize you're a blunt instrument, Bond, and I don't expect you to understand. <laughs> but try to stop blowing people up in <laughs> embassies. <laughs> Dame Judy. Dame Judy, yeah. Uh, I tell you yeah. what's not what's what's not going up, Tony, are uh, houses by the sounds of it. Um yeah. because built Builders are going bust, apparently. Do you yes. see this in the ABC today? No, I've been, oh, I haven't seen it in the ABC, but I've been watching it for the last six months. It's Well, we were talking about it last year when the first of them started to, to go broke, and now it's getting yeah. worse. Yeah, And, and it's mate, because, as we said last year, they've, they've got contracts with fixed prices, but their inputs are going up and they just can't make money. Yeah, my mate Tony Ashwin, who's a builder down in the Gold Coast, when they started to go down, he said, you wait, man, there's going to be a the whole, this is just the beginning of it. Mm. And he was right. This is in the ABC uh, today. How did the construction industry enter an insolvency crisis and how can it get out? 
It says, um, do, 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 scrolling down, Phil Dwyer, president of the Builders Collective of Australia and builder of 40 years experience, says the insolvency crisis in the construction industry is a nationwide problem. He says currently there's a great escalation in insolvencies. The data bears this out. According to ASIC, 1,709 construction companies entered administration between July 22 and April 23 up from 1,284 in the same period 12 months earlier. Dwyer traces the current insolvency crisis back to the Home Builder Grant, which was introduced by the Morrison government in June 2020 as part of its economic response to the COVID-19 pandemic. The program offered a $25,000 grant to owner-occupiers who signed eligible contracts between June 4th and December 31st, 2020, or a $15,000 grant for eligible contracts signed between January 1st and March 31st, 2021. As a stimulus, stimulus measure, it worked too well. As Tim Lawless, research director from Call Logic, told ABC Melbourne's The Conversation Hour in 2022, Home Builder became oversubscribed as people rushed to sign contracts before applications closed. By February 2023, the scheme had received 138,000 applications and distributed $2.52 billion in grants. Dwyer says introducing the Home Builder scheme into an already heated industry created a volume of work that has proved unmanageable for the nation's builders. The government should never have done it, he says. Two years on, supply chain issues and inflation caused by factors such as COVID-19, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, and labour shortages have created a crisis. Builders operating on fixed price contracts who cannot pass on increased costs to customers have been hardest hit, with the price of raw materials such as steel and timber increasing between 40 and 50% during the pandemic. Many operators have simply run out of money to finish projects. Yeah, and so that, that that is exactly what's happening, and it's to my point. If that's one of the problems um, at the moment, in, inflation is you know they're, they're, those builders are facing inflationary issues, and they've got fixed price contracts. So let's put interest rates up. I mean, it's just it's not the answer. It really isn't. The, the government, you know, when I talk about fiscal policy, I'm talking about what the government can do. It sh I haven't heard of any activity yet, but it should be focusing on the industry because builders collapsing means unemployment in the sector and that's going to be a recessionary drag on the economy if it's not happening already then pretty soon uh but yeah the solution put interest rates up it's not the solution it makes it worse mm, maybe we should get somebody from the rba on the show you know mm. anyone in your uh highfalutin circles that you mix in oh i know i know uh, an ex member or two, but I'm not sure yeah. they'll come on. Yeah. <laughs> well, really? yeah. Why not? Yeah. All right. Uh, move, moving right along. Uh, Stephen Mab, chairman, chairman Mab of the Australian Shareholders Association, um, came down from his ivory tower to call me last week. <laughs> <laughs> he heard us complain on the show, me complain on the show last week that uh, the light portfolios are taking a hit because I'm sitting on all this cash and I can't spend it. And suggested we could park our cash in some ETFs. He suggested particularly beta shares ETF AAA, which he said pays 4% less a 0.2 management fee, or in VanEck TBIL 4.5% US Treasury bills. He said at least you'd be getting, it's not a lot, but at least you'd be getting a couple of points on your cash while you uh, sit there and wait for something to buy. And he said the good thing about these things is you can sell them when you um, want to cash, get your cash to invest. What are your thoughts on putting our money in ETFs when we can't buy anything for long periods of time? Um, I, I don't know. I'm not familiar with these two. I had a look at them this morning as I was prepping for the show. Uh, how, how much cash, well, sorry, how long are we holding the cash for in the light portfolios? I mean, I, I I can't say accurately, but I'd say for a month we've been sitting maybe more on a lot of cash. Okay. You know, I get to buy a couple of things here and there, but you know, you know, I, you know, I got yeah. to spend some this week, but I had to buy double parcels of a couple of things mm -hmm. when GNC and KAR became buyers this week, with crude oil and wheat becoming buyers again, which we'll talk about later in the show, but. Um, you know, still sitting on, you know, most of the portfolios, the light portfolios have been sitting on, 
between 20 and 40% cash for weeks and weeks and weeks. No, oh, well, if that's the case, if it's more than a month, then it's worthwhile. But I had a look at the the these two ETFs that Steve recommended. And uh, the first one, which is called um, AA or the stock codes AAA, pays a dividend monthly. So that wouldn't make sense to invest in it. But you are taking risk because it's still listed on the stock exchange and the monthly dividend yield isn't that great. Um, and it could be eaten up by a, a movement in this actual ETF share price, but uh, it's, it's you know, it's possibly a, a place to park it. Um, what I, happened I to question it? Steve's comment what? about 4% yield. I don't think that's the case with it at the moment. What happened to it when Steve called me on the 31st of May? It's <laughs> share price had been going up and then it just fell off a cliff mm. on the 31st of May. I mean, it's only 10 cents out of 50 bucks, but still. Yeah, the movements aren't big, so that's it may just pay a dividend or something. It tends um, to do that. It seems to go up for from the beginning of the month. It, it goes up to the end of the month, and then it falls at the beginning of the next month. So yeah, this it pays is the a dividend. dividend, right? Yeah. yeah. But yeah. I added up the last the last twelve months worth of monthly dividends and got roughly a dollar twenty five on fifty bucks. So it's it's paying about two point five percent yield. And on yeah. the monthly basis, if you divide that by twelve, it's it's you know bugger all. So you're so not really benefiting a great deal. No, a um, couple of other points. I mean, in, in my personal case, I have I've just gone back into the market yesterday, probably the same time you did with the dummy portfolio, because uh, some things turned up, a couple of commodities turned up in Dubai, uh, but there were also some other rises um, which I bought into, uh, but. I think I was only in cash for a couple of weeks at the most. Um, and I, if I think back, the last time I was in cash was COVID and that was a, perhaps a month at the most as well. So I don't tend to stay in cash very long. And that leads me to the last point. Well, there's a couple more points to make. When I do go into cash, it generally sits in an offset account, unless it's in my super fund or something like that, but it goes into an offset account. So I'm saving mortgage interest on that. So that's worth more than putting them into these um, mm. ETFs. Uh, but the other point is that this is these kinds of ETFs are something I was talking about a couple of weeks ago. And it's I, I really want to highlight that <clears throat> the, I'll call it the reach for yield, which goes on um, in the market. Uh, if, if something's offering a good yield, don't ignore the risks. And so the risks for these two ETFs, one is um, a US Treasury bills ETF. So you've got currency risk. I don't know if they hedge, but if they hedge, it it's, it comes at a cost and it reduces your dividend payments. But Treasury bills are bonds and you know bonds have been fairly volatile in the last six or 12 months as interest rates rise. And then there's um, yield curve inversions and potential calamities, which which can you can wake up the next day and the bonds may have moved quite a bit. So it's not you're putting your capital at risk to get a, um, a, a you know a monthly payout, which isn't much. So on a risk weighted basis, I'd be careful about going into these. Um, the same with the Australian cash one. I'm, I'm not sure how it works. I haven't researched it well enough. But again, currencies can move. A fair bit too. So, um, over the course of a month. So, I don't know what the risks are with these. So that's that's. I would just hesitate, without fully understanding the risk to to put money into these kinds of ETFs. What might be worth looking at is um, putting them into. If we're finding that it's hard to to buy something, chances are that, you know, something like one of the sh the short ETFs that we that one of our listeners was exploring about a year ago might be better off for us that um you know like those inverse index etfs that might prove better but again there's a risk there too so um yeah i'm not convinced that this is a good idea all right i uh, i'm looking at the the other one the van eck t bill t b i l is the asx code you know, it shows a bit of movement too, but it's like the other one. Like it sort of hovers between fifty dollars and fifty-one dollars fifty, fifty dollars fifty, and fifty-one dollars fifty. Not to be confused with the uh, first Van Halen album with Sammy Hagar in 1986, fifty-one fifty, which is apparently the LA Police Department's code for uh, I think a crazy person. 
uh, <laughs> on the run. It's a 51.50. Um, yeah, it, it goes up and down by 1%. Like I'm looking at the sort of the two-year chart on it. It seems to go up and down from, you know, as I said, $50.50 to $51.50. Not a lot of movement there, but, uh, and, but it, you know, pays a little bit of a dividend. Yeah, but and, yeah. and like, like I said, I mean, it's... Um... The risk may not be in that in that graph. What happened when the GFC was around, and what happened right. during COVID are probably more pertinent questions. Or if at the start of the Ukraine war, I mean, bonds can move quite a lot. Yeah. Well, this is just a one to three month Treasury bond by the looks of it. Like the chart on the ASX only goes back to May, yeah, nineteenth of May. I don't know how that works. Anywho. You're you're not a fan of the idea. So what do I do in light? With you see, I mean, the difference between light portfolio and your portfolio, the dummy portfolio. We're not sitting on any cash in the dummy portfolio, mm -hmm. but in the four light portfolios, we're sitting on like 60, 65 shares, and it's a they're all recent, relatively new portfolios mm -hmm. over the last year. So you know, there's been a lot of rule ones mm -hmm. in there, and you know, ten percent of them get ruled one, and you've got. 70 stocks on the portfolios that's you know seven replacements and there haven't been seven stocks to buy <laughs> for a long time i'm you know i tend to buy for the light portfolios one or two a week if i'm lucky i can find and usually in the last few weeks they've been second parcels of things that we already own or the you know, this week i end up buying double parcels of kar and gnc just because I knew I was probably not going to get to offload that cash, you know, otherwise. And I thought it's better off having mm -hmm. it in something rather than in nothing. But mm -hmm. so uh, if, you know, I, I don't, we don't have an offset account for the light portfolios. No. What do I, what do, I do with it? I'd leave it. I just leave it in cash, Cam. I mean, if, um, if the stocks that we want to buy are going down, then the cash is actually going up in terms of its usefulness. So even though we're not doing any interest on it. Sure. Just um, doesn't look good in our comparative performance to the STW every month, because the STW the STW is going up and our cash isn't. No, true. Um, I, yeah, we could but, put some kind of notion, you know, notional earnings on cash, but oh, I just think we have to wear it. Yeah, wait yeah. for the t turn around and we'll all look good. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. Suck it up. Uh, and so else just, is... just in recap for people who are having this problem themselves or this issue themselves, um, don't forget that putting, okay, so number one use of cash, I think, is to put it into an offset account, reduce your interest bill. Number two would be to put it into a bank deposit, depending on how much you have, because that's government guaranteed. So that's risk free. Even if you're only earning one or 2% a year and you only have it in for a month, so it's bugger all, it's still risk free. Um, putting it into ETFs, even though they might pay more, does come with some risk. Uh, and nope. without number doing... three is to put it on Tony's horse that's running uh, yeah. at Randwick this week. <laughs> I don't have one racing at Randwick this week, but yeah, go cast in, in the spring. <laughs> <laughs> number four is to find your uh, local friendly mobster and uh, give it to him to put out with a vig. Huh. No, okay, no. <laughs> I can tell you the cafe to go though to ask around. <laughs> yeah, I bet you can. <laughs> It wasn't that many years ago when I was pretty sure that's what you did for a living. Part of the Irish Mafia. The the uh, the Ranger Mafia in Sydney. Uh, somebody else who's uh, not waiting around is Maya CEO, John King. Maya's announced that John King will retire from his role in the second half of calendar 2024 and will return to the US because... Things are just going so well over there. He figured, you know, I don't want to miss out on this great renaissance that's happening in the US. <laughs> um, uh, not exactly uh, in a hurry. No, I think that's, I mean, that's. this is, I think, a hallmark of his tenure. He's given 18 months notice or at least 12 months notice. Hmm. Um, so succession planning should go reasonably smoothly. Yeah, uh, but he's been a terrific CEO, I've got to say, for Meyer, and faced a lot of difficulties. He's turned it round. Uh, I mean, their share price was down around twenty five cents, I think, when he came in, and it's now, even though it's come off recently with the, all the problems with discretionary spending with the, because of rising interest rates, uh, it's still, you know, 
at least double what it was when he came in. Mm. Uh, and he's been, it, it sounds like he hasn't been there for long, but he's been there, I think, since about 2018. So mm. he will have served six years by the back end of 2024, which is a, you know, kind of an average tenure for a CEO. Um, he's had Solly Loose sniping at him the whole time and lots of board issues to try and manage. But he's done a great job. He's um, an experienced retailer and, uh, you know, tip my hat to him. He's done a great job. Share, my share price five years ago was 40 cents, 40.5 cents, currently trading at 68 cents, has been as high as uh, seven just uh, back in March. Mm. But, yeah, it's come off and, quite a and bit it's, since then. And it's, what was its lows? Oh, COVID cough had dropped down to 10 and a half cents. Yeah, right. Okay. Sort of been growing nicely since then. Um, you know, I've I, I, I've done my uh, time as a Maya <laughs> shareholder on and off. Um, we've, we own it in a couple of uh, light portfolios. One's up 14%, the other's up 18%. So it's not taken over the world. But I remember when I owned it in my own portfolio at one point it was up like 100 percent, and then it came all the way back down to yeah its high price <laughs> i was telling uh warren about that in our chat last night like he was asking about the old, the old question that we always get about trailing stop losses and that kind of yeah. stuff and yeah. talking about i said you know it, it explained your thinking around it how um if you stick to the rules with our sell triggers more often than not, it works in your favor. I said, but you don't remember the ones where it's worked in your favor because mm. you didn't sell it, so you didn't think about it. You only remember the ones where mm. it went all the way back down to your buy price and you got out and you, you're you like just pissed, <laughs> pissy about it. But uh, you don't pay attention to the times when it actually works out in your favor unless you go back and do some sort of yeah. analysis. It's funny how that works. Um, okay, so we talked about interest rate rises and wages. Uh, I saw this article in the Fin yesterday, I think. Will DIY investors stay in love with the share market? It's by Jonathan Shapiro. Uh, more than half of the population has a share portfolio, but will high and rising interest rates force them to choose between stocks and property? Um, going on about some event that somebody spoke at. Um, interesting here, it says that uh, 1.2, I think we've talked about this before, but 1.2 million Australians have started investing in the share market since 2020. I think nearly all of them listen to the show. Um, <laughs> that means 10.2 million adults or more than 51% of the population have investments outside of superannuation or the family home home, an increase from 46% in uh, 2022. That's a big jump in one year. But uh, they're saying that with interest rates and the share market's going to struggle, people might feel like they're better off putting money in property. Uh, they have the requisite uh, mention of Scott Pape in here. You can't write an article in the Australian media about investing without talking about Scott Pape. It's, it's in his contract. Um, he needs to be mentioned at, at every opportunity and there needs to be the same photo of him with his bare feet in the camera, apparently. Uh, I don't know why I need to see his feet every time they mention him, but somebody's got a foot fetish like Quentin Tarantino out there. It's because, it's because he's the barefoot investor. I know, but still, do, okay. I, do I have to see his feet every time? They they quote the book really. It's in his contract. His it's in his contract. Yeah. Yeah. Got to got to show off the feet. Yeah. Trademark. Good good thing he didn't call his book the bare ass investor, or they have to have a photo of his ass every time <laughs> they talk about him. Sorry, it's in the contract. <laughs> like living with Fox. Um. So uh, <laughs> he talks about uh, somebody. I don't know who this is here. In February, uh, he posted uh, somebody who goes by the name of Mr. Quick. In February, posed an intriguing question: If you had two hundred thousand dollars to invest, what was the highest return you could achieve with the greatest certainty? The answer is north of ten percent, but there is a caveat. The condition is that the individual has a mortgage over the family home. If that's the case, 
and that person is in the top 45% tax bracket based on current interest rates, any investment has to return more than 10.5% after tax to beat paying off your home loan. If one adjusts for risk premiums, that figure might be about 16%. The point is that there's now extremely high opportunity cost to do anything with your money, including adding to your share portfolio if you're carrying debt. This will have implications for household balance sheets and equity markets. We're now undeniably in an environment of higher interest rates, which few, few Australians have experienced. So he's saying you, you've got to be getting at least 16% to make it worth your while rather than just paying off your mortgage. Yeah, if you factor in the risk premium, hmm. the risk of how many, it. how many super funds in this country are returning an average of sixteen percent per year? No, wasn't well none. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a couple, but not many. Yeah, no, certainly but, not but over super, the long term. Yeah, that, that's right. I mean, he makes a good point. It's basically the point we've been making about rising interest rates that they affect the asset pricing of the growth stocks, the ones that. When interest rates are low or zero, you just throw some money into them and speculate if you can afford it. All that's off the table now that you, you know, that every time you make an investment um, and you've got a mortgage, you're really trying to beat, you need to beat that mortgage hurdle. So the hurdle rate went up for um, mm. people to invest. So yeah, less uh, less people throwing money at or gambling with the stock market is I guess the essence of the article. There's a few other things in there which I liked about uh, only a small percentage of people use a financial planner, basically because of the costs. Mm. Um, and I think that that will improve. Um, the government has to uh, change the rules around that. But you know, people have been talking about robo advice for a long time now. The last four or five years as being the solution, uh, and that's perhaps where you know your mate Chat GPT plays a role in providing off-the-shelf advice for people at a, a very cheap cost. Um, so I think that's potentially in the, on the horizon well, to solve saying, that problem. I think there's a smoke alarm. Must be a oh, no. sourdough bread. It's the clothes dryer. <laughs> I can't hear it. Chrissy had set fire to the house while I'm in here, but it's the clothes dryer making this high-pitched whistling noise. Sorry about that. That's right. I can't hear it. <laughs> oh, well. Doesn't matter if I burn to death as long as you can't hear it. So. Yeah, you'll you get out the time. Come on. You'll you'll wing shun your way through the window or the door or something. <laughs> hey yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Venusian karate. That's what uh, uh, the third doctor knew anyway. The John, John Pertwee, yeah. Venusian judo, I think it was. Venusian mm. judo, yeah. Um yeah. Sorry. Sorry to interrupt there. Get back to your point. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I agree with the article. And um, on top of all that, you know, this is probably, you know, a bit of a chicken and egg thing. If if people are making that decision about whether they invest in the share market or pay off their mortgage, uh, there's less people in the share market. So the share market doesn't go up as quickly or maybe even comes down, which becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So again, this is one of the arguments about... Um, we see people selling out of the market at the wrong time and then getting back in at the wrong time. But according to that article, there's like every man and his dog is now investing in the Australian share market. Um, Was, I think is what he's saying. Well, he said the numbers were up. This know. year or up until what? this year? No, I think it's up until means... Okay, is he saying that... So Okay, so there's the thrust of the article is will they stay? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. He's okay. saying more than 50, uh, 51% of the population of investments outside of superannuation of the family home, an increase from 46% in 2022. So there's another, an extra okay. 5% of the population are invested in it this year. This is from a, um, he's linking to a study done, uh, it's in the, uh, quoted in the Finn May 30th, so a week ago. Pandemic frenzy spawns 1.2 million new Australian investors by Lucy Dean. Um, yeah. So saying that, you know, a whole ton of people are investing. Women accounted for 50% of the new investors and also made up 50% of those intending to invest. ASX senior manager Rory Cunningham 
told the Stockbrokers and Investment Advisors Association. I wonder if he then told everyone to sell their shares in the ASX because uh, <laughs> it's not it's not having a good day. No, ASX well, I just came itself. out and said chess wouldn't be replaced until was it another twelve years or thirty thirty two. Thirty thirty two, yeah, eight years. <laughs> <laughs> I I read through that story this morning to try and figure out um, who was the IT main IT contractor who's been who was pitching the whole oh we'll do it on blockchain it's all going to be great don't you worry about it wasn't Chinese walls was it well I, I don't know <laughs> but there was no mention I don't know if it was all you know completely internal build or if yeah, which would be rare these days I think no, companies they... don't tend to have huge IT departments like that. No, they partnered with a with a blockchain what you, installer, assembler. I don't know what you call it. A blockchain company. <laughs> I forget who they were. I could think of other words I could use, but I probably get sued, <laughs> so I better not. <laughs> um, anyway, back to fifty women of fifty percent of new investors. Well, you know, we did a show about mm. getting more women investing, and obviously it paid off. So you're welcome, oh. females. <laughs> Well, it's great uh, to there. see. It is good to see. They should be making up 50% of investing or investors. Well, the head of research and investment trends, Irene Guatmatia, said that while women made up 50% of new investors, the percentage of overall investors who were female had not moved from 42% since 2020. Still, 42% is a lot higher than it I is. would have guessed. I thought yeah. it was like 10%, 42%. Yeah. That's pretty good. Good on you, ladies. Well done. Um, but uh, yeah, my question was going to be if the case okay, is all these people are investing in the share market. We yep. know they're not um, uh, going to financial advisors because they're too expensive. Mm -hmm. We know they're not listening to us. So where how where, where are they getting their investing strategies from? Do you think Inst TikTok in influencers? Yeah, <laughs> that's what the article suggested. Um, but you don't know how many are just buying ETFs as well. Or Bitcoin. Or Bitcoin, yeah. We don't know much about where they're investing. Because it doesn't talk about share market investors. It talks about investing outside of super and the family home. They could be buying wine or art or cars or watches or anything collectible as well. Mm. Mm. Okay, race horses. Yeah. I had seen some... I'm su like kind of surprised by those numbers uh, in that I had seen articles about the people who withdrew money during COVID, um, you know, now having not much left and going home with their tails between their legs um, and the numbers dropping. So I'm surprised that this year's higher than last year. Hmm. Well, I mean, uh, do you think you can do better than 16%, Tony? Well, I have over the over time, but it, that is getting to be a, a quite a high threshold, isn't it? I think a dummy portfolio is returning about 16% now. Yeah, per yeah. annum over the long run. Yeah. Mm. But for me, the mindset isn't, you know, um, how much tax am I paying? Add that to the mortgage, add the 6% risk premium everyone talks about and try and reach that hurdle. It's can I make any money in the share market? Yes. And can I have the dividends pay the mortgage interest rate? Yes. So. To me, it's still a no-brainer, but I, I accept the premise that the person was talking about in the article. Right. Not how I see it, though. Okay. Let me ask you a, a, a question. So, Nevexa, um, somebody sent me an email uh, last night uh, about uh, the light portfolios and how one of them's doing, one of them's up 20-odd percent, one of them's down 20%, or well, down 10% actually, but it's 20% of capital's down, but then there's dividends that have made up 10%. I think we're actually reporting it down a little bit more than that, but he's saying if, you, if you're real wanting things at 10%, um, why is it down more than 10%? And I said, well, yeah, that's a good question. And and there are there's been a couple of cases, I think OML and RBL too that I can think of, where the share price just fell off a cliff like in one morning and you know right. it was like 20 or 30% down by the time um, I heard about it and could get out. But then I saw GRR. I couldn't figure this out. It said that we bought GRR on the 16th of February, 2022 at 81 and a half cents. 
We sold it on the 2nd of September 2022 at 77 and a half cents. So that's a loss of about four cents a share or about 5% of the buy price. We sold it because it was an iron ore uh, commodity sell. But Navex is showing it as a loss of 54.14% per annum. Now, I'm not very good with the numbers, Tony, so I thought I'd ask you to explain that to me. <laughs> You're asking me about Navexa? Ask Navarre. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Is Navexa trying to extrapolate from a short term to a 12-month figure by multiplying it out 12 times or something? I don't, I don't know. Well, it's not. I mean, we held it for close to seven months. Mm -hmm. That's what I initially thought. Okay, they're annualizing this. Okay, yeah. but if we lost 5% over seven months, over a year, that yeah. would be, 10, let's say, let's say 10%. Mm. Um, how do they get 54%? Even if, like, if this was a year ago, we sold it in September 22, so not even a year ago. How that goes from 5% to 54% per annum, I can't. For the life of me, figure it out. I thought, well, it must be some tricky CAGA uh, no. investing maths <laughs> physics that I don't understand. And no, you'd be able I think to it's explain a to me. It's a question for Navexa. I've got no idea. <laughs> oh, I'm wondering if, if it's wrong, like how much it's pulling down the reported yeah. performance of our portfolio, because that's that's a huge yeah. hit. I mean, it's only one stock out of you know, a bunch of stocks that we've owned in that portfolio, but still okay. I will ask Navare today. Uh, what else have you got to talk about before we get into the Q&As, TK? Yeah, just a couple of things. We're into June, so this is the time for people to have a look at their capital gains tax projections. And depending on what what platform they're using, they should be able to run a report giving them at least the current capital gains tax position for the financial year. And if they need to take some action, then take it. Um, and again, if anyone's not... had a good if anyone's had a good enough year that they have to pay <laughs> capital gains tax. Yeah, send me an email and tell me why. <laughs> yeah, so again, not tax advice, and we say this every year. Talk to your tax accountant. Uh, avoid the wash provisions. But if you, it makes to me, it makes perfect sense, and uh, that you don't carry a loss into next year if you're going to pay capital gains tax. Sell it before June 30. Um, you probably can't buy it back again, but it, if it was trading at a loss anyway, why would you? Uh, and then offset your capital gains tax before June 30. So not tax advice, just common sense. Talk to your tax accountant, run your reports, check it out. Uh, and I guess it's also start of the month. So, you know, I, I've just checked and reset my alerts for um, the cells. Uh, Three-point trend lines do change monthly, you know, especially if the share price is going up. The the uh, graph is going up, so the sell point will go up as well. So i uh, check those. Uh, we already spoke about it, but, there was a couple of new things to buy this week. So people who have kind of given up on what to buy, go and have another look. Um, there might be a few things for you now. Uh, do we have an RBA rate decision yet? Mm. I'll just do a quick, quick Google. Mm. You got one? No. No? See. Okay. Um, news. It's still no, we don't. All right. Bloody clothes dryer going out there. It's... <laughs> I don't know why it's so noisy all of a sudden. It'll come. And we've spoken quite enough about interest rates anyway. So the last thing I've got is to do a pulled pork uh, on AFG. AFG? Yeah. So why? this is a request from Ali. And there's a question later on from Ali about AFG. Mm -hmm. So I may as well kill two birds with one stone. Her, her question is, it's on the buy list. Uh, however... With the fact that interest rates are going up, is Australian Financial Group, which is a mortgage broking business and therefore leverage to the property market, is it still a good thing to buy? Do you worry about those things? Do you try and take a um, do some analysis and take a stand one way or the other? Or do you just suck it up and buy? Um, so I'll answer that during the pulled pork. Okay. Okay. I'll, so go, AF I'll go sell all my holdings in AFG while you do that. <laughs> well, that's one of the things Ali said. She, she hesitated to ask the question because she'd bought some anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Off you go. Yeah, so AFG Australian Financial Group. And, and thanks, Ali. It's a really interesting company. I hadn't 
hadn't really looked at <clears throat> looked at it in depth before. And for a long time, the mortgage broking businesses weren't listed. So this is kind of the first time I've come across in, um, in any sense a, a large, a large-ish mortgage broker business that, that's listed. Uh, when I say large, it's uh, ADT, I think is, uh, where if I can find it, about 450,000 or so. 400, sorry, I'm, I'm wrong about that, 474. So uh, it's, it's, you know, relatively large and will suit lots of people. Give you some background on it. Uh, it's no longer on our buy list. It was up until recently, but it's had a bit of a price rise recently. So it's just below the cutoff uh, on our buy list. So good luck, Ali, if you bought it when it was on the buy list. You will have had at least a little bit of a price bump before it tanks after this uh, pulled pork. You sure about that? <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, it's on my it's on my buy list. Uh, well, the one I've got has a QAV score of 0.07. Uh, really, well, the one I've got's got a QAV score of 0.44. Oh, hang on. A F G Australian Finance, the one that Alex oh, did on the weekend. Sorry, I'm I'm looking at FPR. My bad. Okay. I'm looking at the I'm looking at the one you did the. Uh, Pulled pork on last week. I was just checking to see if it was <laughs> how the share price has gone. <laughs> it's gone. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Ignore all that. Please continue. That's okay. Yeah, no, that's okay. It's, it's, um, yeah, it's just below our buy list. It was on the bottom of it up until recently. Share price has gone up a little bit. So that's good news. Uh, and it may, if it does turn around after this pulled pork, it'll be back on the buy list and you can buy it again. Uh, and and know that they won't come back and do a pulled pork for a while on it. So it's got clear sailing. But look, interesting business. It's a mortgage broker business and it's it's a mortgage broker aggregator, really. So it's 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 making acquisitions um, all the time. It's made three large ones in the last four years and is calling out the fact that they'll probably keep doing them. So it's it's a, a bit of a roll-up, which are good until they stop rolling up, usually. But um uh, that's by the by. Uh, if I look at the business itself, its income is generated either by commissions, uh, which includes the com um, usually an upfront commission, and then what's called a trailing commission on the mortgages that uh, are sold through the uh, the broker network. And trailing commissions are an interesting fact of life in, in the mortgage business. So basically, once you take out a mortgage, the mortgage broker keeps getting paid every year. Well, during the life of that mortgage, a small commission. And that's good if you're the, the broker because you're getting an annuity style income. So you're getting income from past work, which is, which is uh, you know, even if the new work dries up, you still got something coming in the door. So that's a, a bit of a plus for a business like this. Uh, they also do originate their own mortgages and uh, they do that by issuing what's called um, residential mortgage backed securities, something the big banks do as well. But basically, it bundles up the mortgages and then sells them um, on the wholesale market, much the same as a bond, raises money that way and goes out and, and uh, offers more mortgages based on the cash coming in. So it's a bit of a, a bit of a cyclical thing, and they get what's called the net interest margin. So for the mortgages they originate and sell, uh, if they you know if they can get five percent from a customer and they do this um, RMBS into the market. At, at 4%, then they're making 1%. So uh, that's another source of income for them. Uh, interesting, Interestingly enough, this company has 10% of market share of all residential customers. So it's quite, it's becoming quite large and it has over 3,700 brokers out there. Um, they also have, so mortgage brokers operate what's called a panel. So this is like their, their uh, um, switchboard of, of various suppliers offering loans, including um, AFG offering their own loans. Uh, and they can choose any a loan from any of 70 providers to suit the customer. So it's it's you know it's quite a big business and quite a solid business. Um, I, I guess to Ali's question about uh, what's happening with high interest rates and are they cooling the house housing market and they are um, there's a couple of other things that are going on in the market that we all know interest rates are going up, but one of the things driving up interest rates is the fact that during COVID, the RBA lent out money to the major banks using a thing called a term funding facility at a very low rate to try and uh, prop up the economy in, in, what, in the pandemic and 
um, avoiding a recession and, and they didn't know how long the pandemic was going to last and the world was going to end, et cetera, et cetera. Though that's really what's driving a lot of the interest rate rises in the market now because those funds are being repaid by the major banks and therefore they're having to go out and fund their mortgages um, through the normal channels. And with rising interest rates, mortgage rates are, are going up. So what's happening is people who took out 2% fixed terms loans during COVID are now coming off and they're out in the market and having to face, you know, sort of five, six percent type numbers. The good thing for this company is they therefore go to brokers and try and shop around. And so AFG uh, pointed point back to the last time interest rates went up, and that was between probably 2000 and 2007. And they were able to grow their business during that time because one of the, I guess, um, interesting aspects of the mortgage rate market is that as interest rates rise, people become more price sensitive and they don't just accept what their current bank offers. They go into the market and shop around and a large number of them do that via brokers. So uh, they do actually do well um, through the cycle, uh, whether it's going up or not. Uh, whether that whether the you know there's a recession or whether there's a downturn in the housing market because of the interest rates biting is is to yet to play out, and whether that's offset by the fact that people are going to use brokers more as as interest rates become higher um, is is all forecasting, and I can't really tell. But you know, AFG seem reasonably sanguine about it. <clears throat> However, if you look at the consensus um, earnings forecast. Most brokers are saying that earnings per share is going to drop by twenty percent next year for this company. Um, so you know, it's a it's a question of who's right, AFG who say they'll sail through, or the brokers who are being more conservative, a bit in the style of Ali, saying, "Well, interest rates are going up. You know, maybe the mortgage market can crack a bit." Uh, all of that doesn't take into account the fact this company is throwing off lots of cash. And they have a successful track record of going out and acquiring other mortgage broking businesses. Uh, and that, you know, one big acquisition may well negate all the negative aspects of the of mortgage rates um, coming or going up and therefore housing mortgage numbers, volumes coming down. Uh, so that's, that's um, I guess, the background to all this. Uh, by the numbers, uh, the share price I'm doing this analysis on is $1.74 and a half, which is about a cent cheaper than what it is today. Uh, and that price is less than the consensus target, but it is above IV1 and IV2 for us. And as I've already said, um, prop calf is a little bit too high for us on this one because the price has risen. And it's now sitting at 7.3 times. Generally about seven is the cutoff for us. Um, if, if the price falls down a little bit, it'll probably come back onto the, the buy list. A um, couple of interesting things about the numbers. The yield on this company is 9.28%, which is, you know, really high. <clears throat> so they have been able to generate cash and they're paying it out as dividends um, when they can't use it for acquisitions. Um, ROE is 27% and the PE is actually less than the yield on this one. So this is, I've found in my experience, that's a good sweet spot um, uh, to to buy a company at. When the, if you think about it, the, <clears throat> the price, the PE, you're paying for it is less than the yield. So you're kind of being funded to to buy the stock by the own dividend, by its own dividends in a, in a sort of strange way. Um, but it generally is a good indicator of value. Uh, one of the things I found interesting is Stock Doctor don't have a financial health for this company. <clears throat> and they, occasionally they don't, particularly in the, the financial um, space. For a long time, they couldn't uh, financially rate the the banks and they solve that problem. So maybe there's a financial rating coming for these kinds of other um, investments. But to me, it's it's a bit like a bank um, as a way to invest this company. So a bit surprised that I have one bit of an anomaly there, I think. Uh, so, that, But that is a question mark. Um, however, it does score well on all the other metrics, including uh, the uh, fact that the directors hold about 13% of the company. So we have a case where there are owner founders who have experience management holding skin in the game. So that's good. Uh, P is 8.3 at the moment, which is the lowest of the last three years. So that's good. It's it's a new three-point trend line increase. So that's good. doesn't have consistently increasing equity. So we, we don't score it on that. And 
it's below, sorry, the price is above its book value, which is 97 cents and also book plus 30. So we can't buy it on that basis. Uh, so all, all in all, the quality score for this company is 53%, eight out of a possible 15. And the QAV score is 0 0.07, which is just below our, our checklist. Um, the risks for this company, we I guess we've covered them. Declining, um, if the declining earnings per share is accurate, then that might be a drag on the share price, but it's probably factored into the share price. And one of the things as value investors I'm always aware of is that things are cheap for a reason. And the reason we're buying a, a you know quite a good quality company like this is is because people think it the there's um, some fragility in the mortgage market going forward. Uh, however, you, in return, you, you're paying a low low price, getting a good yield, and uh, there's plenty of cash for this company to go and inquire, acquire other companies, which may take up the slack for um, declining uh, mortgage volume. Uh, other risks are that you don't always, these acquisitions don't always go to plan, so they're always betting down issues. They seem to be doing well with them but uh, and getting synergies from them, but that doesn't always occur, so that could be a potential risk. And of course, if there, we do go into a recession, that's going to affect this business as well as, I guess, most businesses. On the positives, it does have good cash flow and experienced management with skin in the game. So I'm kind of, um, you know, I, I won't do any more analysis than that. Uh, the numbers are compelling, not quite at the moment because the share price has risen a little bit. But if it comes back on the buy list, um, it's not big enough for me to buy. But if, it, if that aside, I would be happy to buy it. Well, we do own it in, let's see, I, I have it in my super. Um, we own it in one of the light portfolios. No, we own two parcels of it, one of the light portfolios, actually. It's one of the ones I've doubled up on. And it's doing okay. It's like <clears throat> up 14%, one of those, and 8% in the other, the second parcel mm -hmm. I bought. So, um, yeah, it's been good. And But to get back to Ali's question, like the thinking about, interest rates going up you know when she asked this question on facebook or wherever it was i said to her yeah it sounds to me like forecasting and forecastings mm. for the weather um mm. we tend not to forecast <laughs> a good saying yeah <laughs> we stole that one from that guy that steve put us on to a couple of weeks ago forecasting okay. is for the weather and you said and even then they get it wrong most of the time <laughs> i think i think i said to i said to ali in facebook even most, you know, economists and analysts get it wrong most of the time. Mm -hmm. So we tend not to forecast. Would that, would that be a, a fair representation of your views with this? You don't really think too much about, oh, interest rates no. are going up and therefore blah, blah, blah. It's just the numbers are good. I'm buying it. Correct. And look, yeah, it's, um, it's, it's, we don't buy them if the stock, stock price is going down. So if, the people who understand this company far better than me think it's worth, you know, it's not going to be all doom and gloom. They're buying it and it's trending up and it's just become a three point trend line buy for us. You know, there's somebody else there who knows far more about it than us who will get, who are buying it. So, mm. yeah, I know that's trusting in the market to a certain extent, but it's the wisdom of crowds and all that. But um, mm. yeah, we have enough, we have enough um, framework around things to protect us if we get this wrong in terms of selling out with rule ones and three point trend line sales. So mm -hmm. that's the other side of the equation is, you know, if, if we don't know what's going to happen, but the numbers look compelling and we get it wrong, well, we'll sell out quickly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. Yeah. That's where the stop losses come into play. Yeah. Because so uh, say to the new people, when they give me a call, like, you know, the, the premise of QAV is very, very simple. You know, companies that have a good track record of producing a lot of cash and good management, if we can buy them at a discount, more often than not, they should do well. But if we get it wrong, that's okay. We have ways of mechanisms to get us out. And we mm -hmm. only expect to get it right six out of 10 times. So Correct. that's it, you know. Yeah, and it all just comes out in the wash. It's that simple. That's QAV, and <laughs> that's my elevated pitch for QAV. Yeah, right. Buy, yeah, buy good companies at a discount and have rules in place to get out if you know it goes the wrong way. Yeah, yeah and I guess the only other thing I'd add to this is that things come onto our buy list for a reason. We can't, you know, if something is is a good company and it's trading cheaply, chances are there's a, some uncertainty about the future around it. Mm -hmm. um, and that's creating that's creating you know some noise in the market and people are standing aside saying I don't want to take the risk but 
you know, we have <clears throat> we have other rules than that. We check the quality of the company. We wait for some sentiment to return to it, you know, possibly by the insiders or the people who know it well, mm-hmm. and then we jump on board. Mm. Good stuff. Thanks for that, Ali. All right. Thank you, for Tony. I, one thing I didn't do in, in the other section is the portfolio updates. Um, I send them out to people in emails anyway, but for people that are interested, um, I did do my uh, analysis this morning, uh, getting ready for the weekly update email blog post thing. Dummy portfolio is still doing about two and a half times the benchmark since inception, about 16.54% per annum. So over the last like three and a half years, it's doing okay versus what well, it's like 7%, I think, for the STW. Um, financial year, we're still lagging the STW, but we're doing okay. We're like 12% or something up for the financial year. Coming to a close, it's fine. Nothing to worry about there. Mm. We're lagging the STW by a bit, but, you know, so be it. Uh, for the quarter report, we're basically neck and neck with the STW. We're both up about 1%. We're in the last mm-hmm. stretch of the quarter. Nothing's gone anywhere. No one's done anything for the last couple <laughs> of months. So, But we're at the same, you know, so nothing to crow about. Uh, in terms of the last seven days, a lot of red in our portfolio holdings, except for KSC, which is up 16%, 16.4% in the last seven days. So I don't know what's going on at KSC, but they've had a great week. Uh, but uh, everything else is largely red um, by a bit, sort of offsetting that. We did sell CRG, uh, sorry, SRG and replaced it with FPR on the 31st of May. That's been the only trading that we've done in the dummy portfolio in the last week, but a little bit in the light portfolios, as I mentioned before. To to do Q and A, we'll do another couple of questions. TK, yeah, sure. Then you can get back to watching spiders. <laughs> um, it's your new hobby. Race horses are boring now. You know, watch your spiders. Uh, Sam, Sam says hi, Cameron. Since oil is a buy again, perhaps you could include WDS and HZN Horizon on the podcast conversation. I think WDS is a buy, and HZN could be too. Thanks, Sam. I had a look. Um, yeah, I think they're both sort of quasi-Josephines. Um, Horizon, when I checked a couple of hours ago or an hour ago, was uh, barely a Josephine. I think it was trading at $0.14. Cents. Month close was $0.15. Cents. It's close. It's on the line nearly. WDS uh, is pretty much uh, on the line, on its second buy line line, I think. Um, at around 34.7 cents. So I think it's probably um, borderline. I'd probably wait until it goes a little bit above the second buy line before I jumped in personally. But um, what do you think about those two, Tony? Yeah, so Cameron's asking, sorry, Sam Sam is asking you, Cameron. Sam is asking, since uh, oil is now buy again, what about Woodside? Well, Woodside is probably three quarters LNG. And that's not a buy, it's a Josephine. So I'm going to take Woodside off the table based on that. And uh, Horizon is, it looks like, oil. Uh, but I've got it being right on its sell price today. So I'm going to take Horizon off the board, off the, uh, off the table because of that. Yeah, okay. Uh, so, so so Sam needs to be, like, be careful with, that because like companies are sometimes called an oil company but they're actually or an energy company but they're actually mainly lng so um sam i'm hoping you got access to the scorecard uh or the buy list which has the commodities in it have a before you buy something as part of your research have a look at the commodity that's the, the majority commodity for the company and just then check that commodity yeah, graph. We, we have ws as a as a sell actually because of lng yeah. Um, and HZN, you think too, huh? It's right on its sell price. So unless it turns around, um, I wouldn't buy it. But uh, but yeah, otherwise, it, if it does turn around, yeah, sure. It's an all, It looks like it's an all, completely an all company. Um, yeah. Majority an all company. Um, and therefore, I could buy it. Yeah, right. 
its graph looks kind of funny. Like I think it's in the bread later, it's just sort of dropped today, right? To hit that sell yeah. price. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, good point. All right. Thank you for the question, Sam. Uh, only other question we've got is from Ed. Ed says, Cam, you say crude and wheat are buys, but as at the Wednesday last week, last day of May, they were both sells. Should we wait another couple of weeks to see where the trend goes or is three days of rising enough to run with? Uh, no, I jumped point. in, <laughs> at least on the oil on the oil side of things. Yeah. Right. And uh, why, Tony? What's your thinking there? Oh, it's crossed the byline. That's that's all. I'm not going to wait another three weeks or three, you know, a month to confirm that. Mm. Um, it appears to be on an upward trend, mm. and it, so it's breaking out. So that, I'm happy with that. Mm. All right. Well, my wife just slipped me a note saying Fox distracted me. The bread should be ready in about 20 minutes. So she had one job, which was to put the bread in the oven while I did the show. Um. That's the big news. You see, slip it. He came in and slipped me a note like a, <laughs> I like saw a producer. Yeah. It was, a, <laughs> it was about the bread. I was sitting here funny when you were doing the pulled pork before. I was going, I should be able to smell bread baking, but I can't smell bread baking. What's what's going on? I knew something was awry. You had one job. Put the bread in the oven. All right. Um, well, thanks, Ed. That's that. Tony doesn't wait. Tony jumps. Mm. Sometimes well, just it... like we don't we don't wait if something crosses the sell line to see if that was going to go back above it. Um, mm. Mm. Same thing applies for something which breaks out. We've already waited. We've waited for it to go yes. above its buy line. You know? Correct. Yeah, that's what we wait for. Once it goes yeah. above, that's the waiting is over. Like smoothly transitioning to after hours, <laughs> fans of the Sparks, their new album came out this week. <laughs> Uh, the Sparks' new album is called The Girl Is Crying In Her Latte and uh, it's uh, it's terrific it's a terrific album if you're into the oh. Sparks have you seen the Good. film clip for The Girl Is Crying In Her Latte with Kate Blanchett yes I have yeah <laughs> it's classic <laughs> it is isn't uh, it? <laughs> yeah just her dancing uh, yeah. sort of free form <laughs> in between them <laughs> to the track yeah. Um, yeah, the, like if you're into the Sparks, if you're not into the Sparks, you know, obviously you're going to hate it, but if you're into the Sparks, it's a great album. And there's this one track that's just been stuck in my head. It's called nothing is as good as they say it is. And, um, I'm trying to see if I can bring up the lyrics here. Uh, I don't think I could do that without playing it in, uh, Spotify, but Basically, the lyrics are written from the perspective of a newborn baby. It says he's 22 hours old. And the baby's basically saying, not impressed. Nothing's as good as they told me it was going to be. Can I go back? The chorus is, mama, mama, please tell me it's not too late. <laughs> basically saying, yeah, everything. They told me it was going to be great out here. It's not. It's it's uh, really not what I thought it was going to be. Can I change my mind and go back to my nice little warm <laughs> zone I was in before? I was way more comfortable there than I am now. Of course, all of their songs are uh, comedic. It's one of, the, one of the things I really admire about these guys. Like they're in their mid-70s. And this is, I think, their 23rd album or something like that. And it's like the genres are all over the place. There's hard rock songs. There's dance numbers, 80s sounding numbers. There's just like no defined genre. They're a bit like, I mean, they're a bit like uh, Al Yankovic, you know? It's like yeah, right. any, any genre. Hmm. There's a, there's comedy in there. It's all over the place. Anyway, yeah. I, know we've got a, I know we've got a few uh, listeners who are fans of the Sparks including at least one who saw them live back in London in the 70s. Wow. Um, I think it was Jeff, maybe. Somebody told me they saw them. So anyway, um, if you haven't checked that out, I recommend it. The girl is crying in her latte. And if you haven't seen the film clip for that song, look it up on YouTube because it's it's pretty cool. <laughs> Kate Blanchett. It is a lot of fun, isn't it? Yeah. Kate like, <laughs> she's she, she can do no wrong in my book. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> every film she's in every role she's just really great and she seems cool 
to yeah. just go and, go and just be in this film. Apparently she came backstage. I think I heard the story was she came backstage at one of their concerts and said, hey, I'm a big fan. And they were like, great, you want to be in a film clip? <laughs> <laughs> They reached out to her and said, Hey, you want to be in this thing? And she's like, Yeah, I'd love to. <laughs> so she rocked up. <laughs> yeah. And I don't know who did the choreography, but it is quite striking. I I don't think there is any. I, yeah, I think right. she just she just improvised. dressed up in one of yep. Russell's uh, yellow suits and just yep. improvised. Yeah. Big big headphones on. Yeah. yeah. She just danced. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh what about you, well, Tony? What, yeah, what well, been... in terms of new albums, um, there's a new record or new sorry album out from uh, everything but the girl which is a band i used to love yeah really they're still around 80s they just re restarted yeah right <clears throat> so that's really good um <clears throat> so i'll be listening to that otherwise down and just been down in wagga wagga playing golf with mark um yeah just being very cozy and comfortable in the winter down there so watching the spiders yeah watching spiders he walks a lot of sport, which is what people do in Wagga Wagga. Um, yeah, Wagga it was Wagga, really good. Really Wagga relaxing. Wagga Tourism Bureau really is really missing out. They should be promoting the spider watching more. Come to Wagga Wagga. <laughs> watch spiders eat cockroaches live. T- recommended yeah, yeah, by should, Tony Kynaston. We should turn it into a sport and start taking bets on it. <laughs> <laughs> like cock, cock fighting. <laughs> yeah. Spiders versus cockroach. Who yeah. will win? <laughs> Line up, line up twelve cockroaches and near a spider's web, and take bets on which one survives. Or you have twelve spiders and twelve cockroaches, and you see which spider catches and eats the cockroach first. Lots of ways you can slice and dice this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, don't they? Isn't don't they in Central America or something? Pit scorpions up against tarantulas to see who's going to win. They bet on the outcome. I think I saw that in a Bond film or something. Yeah. Some there's nothing new in marketing, is there? My other uh, new musical discovery is an American uh, lady blues guitar player and singer called Jackie Venson. Uh, been around a few years, apparently. You know, I think her first album came out 2019. I just discovered it. Um, great. If you like the blues, she, you know, some acoustic stuff, just simple laid back. Guitar, Mm -hmm. voice, blues, B.B. King, sort of, you know, Muddy Waters style. Yeah, I've been digging her the last week. Terrific, terrific musician. And the thing about great blues guitarists is they always want to make me be able to play the blues. So every time I hear a good blues album, it makes me want to pick up my guitar and go, "Yeah, Yeah, yeah, I just want to play the blues for a while. It just sounds easy when they do it and it sounds just bitch ass cool i saw a, a tiktok of keith richards too the other day just sitting in a room somewhere with an old strat 67 strat or something just playing some lazy blues mm. riffs just him in a little amp just chilling it's so cool keith is so great just to watch keith just by himself playing guitar just awesome yeah Pops up on my Facebook reels a lot too, and you think, yeah, it looks easy, and then you, yeah, you, know, you, try, you try it. It ain't so easy. Yeah, but I love that Rolling Stones uh, blues album that came out what three or four years ago now. Or, no, yeah. more than that, half a dozen years ago now. The one, the we last, got... yeah, the last one with um, um, Charlie on drums. I think. Yes, yeah, I think it was. What's it called? Blue all over or something? But it's, oh, fantastic. Just way back to their blues roots. Yeah, and I don't know if you've have you seen the latest Toyer and Robert uh, song they've put out clip. Oh, this what's Sunday lunch yeah, some... clip. It was um, well, the last one I saw anyway was Akadaka. It was back in black, I think, and she's 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 wearing like just a a, a shirt open, no bra. Um, this open shirt sort of tight like the buttons tied up with like a ribbon or something and a fan blowing on her so she's like you know looking fairly raunchy up top and he's playing but she's doing the vocal she's got a mirrored uh, ray-bans on like i said to chrissy th- these two are like relationship goals for us <laughs> I-, I think he's in his mid-70s she's in her mid to late 60s mm-hmm. and they're just playing acdc she's like 
semi-naked with a fan on, just looking super cool, rocking out. It's so cool, those guys. I love it. Yeah. Well, the last couple I saw, they were they were rehearsing for they're going to do a, a live tour. Because it started off being a COVID yeah, yeah. thing. Their Sunday roast was a yeah, you know, what they did on Sunday lunches right around their house. And they yeah. put it out on, on TikTok and YouTube. Yeah. But now they're gonna tour, which would be fantastic to see. Yeah. I mean, the first really... time I saw Toya Wilcox was when she was in Quadrophenia, looking completely different to how she looks now. Quadrophenia, really? Yeah, yeah. She's one of the mod chicks in Quadrophenia. Really? I've never seen that, embarrassingly. Oh, it's fantastic. Really? Oh, I've track Quadrophenia it down. is brilliant. I've listened to the soundtrack, but I've never actually seen it. Yeah, it's a great soundtrack. And yeah. a great cover, Pearl Jam covered uh, Love Rain Over Me too, which is a fantastic cover. Really? Really, really good. Yeah. But no, the movie's brilliant. Yeah. The mods and the Rockers. Yeah. Hmm. And it's got, uh, who's the guy? Um, oh, I've forgotten his name now. That plays a lot of gangsters in British movies, plays with the Rocker, one of the Rockers. Stings in it. Um, yeah. Really good. Really? Wow. Mm. I'm just looking at the cast now, trying to see who you might be talking about. And uh, it's got a, got a big cast. There you go. Toya Wilcox, Ray Winstone. Is Ray Winstone, that's the guy I'm thinking of, yeah. Oh, God, he was in doing stuff way back then, yeah? Yeah, he's probably a teenager at the time, well, they all were. Yeah. yeah, I love Ray Winstone. I haven't seen him for ages. What was the thing he did with um, uh, Gandhi? Sexy Beast. Sexy Beast, yeah, fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great movie. Oh, largely, ben... largely for Ben Kingsley. Yeah, yeah. It was, ben Kingsley was just amazing in that. Ian McShane was in it as well. Yeah, yeah. Ray Winstone was great. I remember going <laughs> to uh, the New Farm Cinema and seeing a double of Quadrophenia and The Kids Are All Right. Yeah. And, and if you haven't seen The Kids Are All Right, one of my favourite films. Really? Yeah. I've seen Do- either, documentary no. on the hoots. Just so funny, so brilliant. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, check that out. Mm. Told you about. Uh, I think I've told you before, but I had the opportunity once to to meet Pete and Roger to oh. do a podcast interview with them. They were coming to Melbourne back in my Melbourne days, and um, their PR people contacted me and asked me if I wanted to do an interview with them. And I said, "Yes." <laughs> Are you kidding me? And then Pete's whole child pornography on his uh, computer thing hit. Yep. And they pulled all of the media stuff. And so yeah. it never happened. But that okay. was, yeah, that was disappointing. Would have been, that would have been so cool. Anywho. Yeah. Gosh, it would have been. I know yeah. I've got an um, old uni mate in Brisbane who was a Channel 7 reporter and he used to get all the music interviews and he once interviewed. Robert Plant from Led Zeppelin and just raved about him and said, you know, one of the only people he's ever met who just com- seems completely to have gotten it together. Mm, that's yeah. impressive. Mm. I mean, yeah, dealing with that level of fame, lifelong fame has got to be very difficult. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, okay. That's it for QAV this week. Thank you, TK. You got any trips planned between now and next week? Nothing, but uh, looking forward to having Alex up here in just over a week's time. Oh, lovely. Yeah, she's coming up next week, middle of next week, and she's working on the Affordable Art Fair up here. Right. Lovely. Yeah. So get along if you're in Sydney and buy some paintings. You probably Yeah, know. absolutely. Hmm. Um, but don't commission any more paintings from her until she's finished my painting. Yeah, it's a bit embarrassing. She's she gets all anx- anx- anxious about the fact she hasn't done paintings. Yeah. Yeah. Well, she shouldn't worry. We're not in any hurry. Okay. All right. Thanks, TK. Okay. Have a good week. All right. Thanks. Bye.